In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart to confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching Him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. Almighty God, our Maker and Redeemer, we poor sinners confess unto you that we are by nature sinful and unclean, and that we have sinned against you by thought, word, and deed. Wherefore, we flee for refuge to your infinite mercy, seeking and imploring your grace for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. Most merciful God, who has given your only begotten Son to die for us, have mercy upon us. And for his sake, grant us remission of all our sins. And by your Holy Spirit, increase in us true knowledge of you and of your will, and true obedience to your word, to the end that by your grace we may come to everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, has had mercy upon us and has given his only Son to die for us, and for his sake forgives us all our sins. To those who believe on his name, he gives power to become the children of God and has promised them his Holy Spirit. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Grant this, Lord, unto us all. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who can stand? Though with you there is forgiveness, that you may be feared. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the God on high, and on earth peace, good will toward men. We praise thee, we bless thee, we worship thee, we glorify thee, we give thanks to thee for thy great glory. O Lord God, heavenly King, God, the Father, 
The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O God, our refuge and strength, the author of all God, godliness, hear the devout prayers of your church, especially in times of persecution, and grant that what we ask in faith we may obtain. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. The Old Testament reading for the 22nd, chap 22nd Sunday after Trinity is written in the book of Micah, the 6th chapter. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? This is the word of the Lord. The epistle is written in St. Paul's letter to the Philippians, the first chapter. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I am sure of this, that he who has begun a good work in you will bring it to completion in the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about you all because I hold you in my heart. For you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness, how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more, with knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent, and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ, the glory and praise of God. This is the word of the Lord. Alleluia! He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. Alleluia! The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 18th chapter. Peter came up and said to Jesus, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but seventy times seven. Therefore the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him ten thousand talents. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had, and payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything." And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii, and seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, Pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. He refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. 
And should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant, as I had mercy on you? And in anger his master delivered him to the jailers, until he should pay all his debt. So also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you, if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. This is the Gospel of the Lord. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things, Christ his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. 
Dear friends in Christ, the time had come. Solomon finally finished the temple project, which he embarked on for a very long time. And now the time had come to bring all of the temple furnishings and put them in their proper place from the city of David into the temple itself. And finally, the time had come. The Ark of the Covenant, in royal procession, would make its way into the holy temple. Now the time had come for the temple to find its place, for the Ark of the Covenant to be in that place, in the most holy place. The time had come. No longer did that Ark of the Covenant have to wander out in the desert and be placed in a tent of meeting. No longer did it belong in the home of Abinadab or Obed-Edom for various reasons. Now it would find its place, its home. And whenever God is on his way in procession, the people of God do not stand beside the road idly. No. They don't just glance at him and then glance away and think of something else. No. They're there to watch. They're there to praise, to cheer. And, in this case, to make sacrifice. You see... This is a royal and holy possession, procession, better than the president's motorcade passing by as onlookers are on the street, or to a grander procession than, than a king going from one place in his kingdom to another, and more fabulous than the Pope Mobile riding around through town and Pope Francis blessing the people. The Lord was going to his dwelling place. And this was the most important thing of the day. But instead of singing and cheering, the people of God instead made sacrifices. Many, many sacrifices. So many sacrifices, it says in 1 Kings chapter 8, that they couldn't even count how many sacrifices there were. This is what they knew to do. The sacrifice was the covenant sacrifice. They thought that they had to do these things. They didn't know much about where it would come from. Sure, their father Abraham, their forefather Isaac and Jacob would do these sacrifices much like them, but this was all the honor due to God from a people who did not understand much about how to honor God, other than to make sacrifices to him. So many of those they did that day. And so now we, we fast forward just a bit in the Old Testament. And we go to Micah chapter 6, our Old Testament reading for today. And we hear what he says. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Now these questions are rhetorical because these things are exuberant, but yet they're very valid. Are those things the things that we do in order to express our devotion to God, in order to call to mind that this is how God loves us, really those things that we do in order to be loved by God? So the more we do, the more sacrifices that we make, the more we keep them in timely honor, then God will love us more, that he will favor us more, that he will promise us more, and that he will give more. You see, that's the impetus behind the sacrifices of the people of God in that day. They thought that they were keeping something of the past, and that if they do them all the more, God would love them all the more. Micah was telling them, that they're wrong. And yet we see this is where the problem lies with the people in the time of Micah and the people in the time of Solomon as well. The people thought that God loved them because of the sacrifices that they made. 
Even though the prophet Hosea would say things like, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, they continued to make sacrifices. The sacrifices that they thought would be so pleasing to God that God would honor them and love them all the more for it. They thought that the performance was their religion instead of the faith that they were to have in a God who loved them so much. Now, it's understandable how people are like that, especially, you know, with our reading of the Old Testament. And we knew that sacrifices were things that the people of God were supposed to do. But yet, we too are the people who are much like those Old Testament people in how we carry out acts in order to, well, accomplish certain results. Now, you know this to be true from your everyday life. You're going to have to get in there and do it in order for it to get done. We're results-driven people. And for the errands that we run and the things that we do, this is exactly the case. I mean, for crying out loud, we know that the house is not going to get cleaned unless we roll up our sleeves and we get after it. We know that the errands aren't going to be run unless we get out there and do them. This is how life operates. Now, the problem is is that we think that our life operates like this in every single aspect of our life, including our life before Christ, our life in faith. It doesn't. And for this reason, I want you to think about changing your attitude. It's time to change our motivations. It's time to change our understanding of how this works. Now, I'm going to give you another example, and I'm sure you were just like me. Because whenever I was a kid... Every time that I had to do something, I would always ask mom, do I really have to clean my room? Do I have to go to school today? Didn't like school much. Do I have to go to church? We always thought about the things that we had to do. And those have-to things became burdens to us. We still think in these terms as adults, we have to get these things done in order to finally get them accomplished. And this sometimes tears at us quite directly. We live in a have-to life. We have to get them done. But I don't want you to think of your faith life in those terms. Instead of this being a place of a have-to, I want you to think of your life in Christ and your life here gathered before God and your fellow individual believers as a get-to type of place. You see, that's different. I know what you're saying. (laughs) This place really is a have-to type of place. If you look at the third commandment in the Ten Commandments, which means that you are supposed to honor the Sabbath day by keeping it holy... But even that commandment has a get-to purpose. Even that commandment gives us the idea and lets us know how God loves us so much that he gathers his people for the sake of each other and for our own good. This is the place where he blesses us. This is the place where we hear his word preached and care is given to you. This is the place where God's people gather together and encourage and strengthen one another. This is how we're sustained. And because of that, this place is a gift to us. And that is a get-to thing, and not a have-to thing. Beloved, we need to change our attitudes about church. The world needs to change its attitude about church. We need to change our understanding about coming here. Think not of it as a have-to, but a get-to. This place is not a place where we come and get points from God when we come to church yet again this week. Or even in this COVID age to tune in online and we watch from our place in order to keep ourselves or our families or the people that we come into contact safe. No, the place that is here God's gathered guests at his table, at his font, at baptism, here around the pulpit in the written and spoken word, are get-to type of things. And this is why this becomes very important. That especially, after all this COVID stuff is over, 
When we feel safe and are loving our neighbor in the right way, doing all the things that we know we need to do in order to be safe in this world, in this community, we all need to come back together to this place. We need it because it's a get-to place. It's a get to receive what God has given to us. You see, Christians, you get to be in service to God and one another by being here. We get to show the love of Christ. This is how we honor and bless others through Christ's work. His beloved children, loving and honor and blessing each other. To help, to sustain, sustain one another. All of this is get-to stuff. I'll give you one more example. Think about it this way. On your birthday, or on Christmas perhaps, you might receive a very special gift from a loved one. You get that gift because that person loves you. And that person freely gives you something that you need out of love. No strings attached. You receive it, you realize it's the something you don't have, that you need, that you want, and you become very joyful over it. It strikes you that this will be something that you'll use every day, that will bring you joy, that maybe will make your life easier, that you'll always remember the person who gave it to you because you get to use it. It's the gifts that we get that we don't really want, that we don't care about, that we throw away and that we never look at or use again. Those are the words, those are the ones that are invaluable. Those are the ones that we receive and yet we throw away because they're more, well, I had to get it in order to show that I am appreciative of someone's gift. No, our Lord is the one who gives us the get-to gifts. The Israelites near the temple that were making sacrifices as the Ark of the Covenant was now coming into the holy temple, they thought that they had to do that. The people in the time of Micah were making more sacrifices than their neighbor and thought that because they would do that, God would love them more. Micah corrected them and said, it is love and mercy that matters most to your Lord. Jesus, beloved in the Lord, gives us all that we need. And this, this here, the unending love that never fails or falters for us, this here, the gathering of God's people, whether, wherever we are, is a blessed and wonderful get to receive even more of the blessed gifts opportunity. That's what today is for the faithful. It's a get-to. That's why we come. You are blessed. In the name of Jesus, amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. In our prayers this day, we remember those who are listed in our bulletin. We pray for Ron Shack and Paul Schubach and Laverne Ludy, Liz Kimball and Bradley Hagler, Warren Stulak and Craig and Karen Kalnan, as well as Blake Fowler, Rebecca Belt, Susan Kim and Elwood Trotter, Joyce White, Bob Stewart and Jean Kraft. 
Karen Smith and Lisa Reck, Brian Moore, Pat Thielen, Craig and Heather Doherty, as well as Crystal Watson and Quentin Olmsted, Brenda O'Toole, Rick Lorfing, and also David Richardson, Greg Goodson, Hal Sinclair, Martha Carr, Ali Kaki, Bonnie Keller, and John Vincenti. We also pray this week for Gabby Sennett and her unborn daughter. They are home from the hospital. We also pray for Thomas Hendricks, who is recovering from surgery. We pray this day also with a petition of thanksgiving for Linda Reinhardt, who is finished with treatments. We, she also had a, a surgery to remove the port, and she's home and doing very well. We also pray this day uh, for orphaned children, and we also continue our prayers for those who are sick and suffering during this current epidemic. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Dear Heavenly Father, today we come before you and we pray for all who have been baptized into Christ, that filled with the fruit of righteousness, they would do justice, love kindness, walk humbly, and have their love abound all the more. We pray for Matthew, our Synod President. We pray for Lee, Robert Lee, our District President, for Greg, our Circuit Visitor, for all pastors and teachers and deacons and DCEs in Christ, that all would know nothing but Christ and Him crucified and serve Him alone. We pray for this congregation and also all the congregations of our Synod, that our members would love one another, bear one another's burdens, and be quick to forgive one another, so that all grudges and bitterness would be removed from among the people of God. We pray for good stewardship among God's children, that recognizing that all we have is a gift from above, they would, with thankful hearts, faithfully support their congregations and be eager to share their blessings with others in need. We pray for the governing authorities, that they would lead according to God's will so that the people of our land may live peaceful and quiet lives. We pray for all those who are sick and suffering in any way and for all who have requested our prayers, especially Ron and Paul, Laverne, Liz and Linda, Bradley and Warren, for Craig and Karen, for Blake and Rebecca, Susan and Elwood. We pray for Joyce, Bob and Jean, Karen and Lisa, Brian, Pat, Craig and Heather. We pray for Crystal, Quentin, Brenda, Rick, David, Greg, Hal, Martha, Ali, Bonnie and John. We pray especially this week for Gabby and her daughter, as well as for Thomas. We pray this day also for all those who are suffering during this current pandemic, that they would be relieved of their afflictions according to the Lord's will, or strengthened to endure. We pray for all orphans. We ask that you would guard and protect children who need protectors, those to love him and to provide for them. Provide loving families for all children in need. For it is into your hands, O Lord, that we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
Let us pray. Blessed Lord, you have caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning. Grant that, that we may so hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that by patience and comfort of your holy word, we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, world without end. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you, be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace.